Tom Nappy here, and welcome to HCAM News Focus. On this edition, award-winning actor and musician Gary Reed performs at the Hopkinton Public Library. Gary has been a bluegrass enthusiast and historian for over 40 years. His one-man show, entitled A Life of Sorrow, tells the tale of Carter Stanley. Carter was a bluegrass music lead singer who formed the Stanley Brothers with his younger brother, Ralph Stanley. Gary Reed's A Life of Sorrow has been performed nearly 70 times at theaters, festivals, libraries, and museums in 13 different states. And right now, we have Gary Reed's A Life of Sorrow performed at the Hopkinton Public Library. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're pleased to have Gary Reed performing today. He's a longtime resident of Roanoke, Virginia, who has been involved in bluegrass and old time music for over 40 years. <clears throat> in that time, he's been a performer, a record producer, a concert promoter, a writer, and historian, and is a three time winner of the International Bluegrass Music Association's Award for Best Liner Notes. He's the author of two recently released books, for which he received the 2015 IBMA Award for Print Media Person of the Year. One of the books is The Music of the Stanley Brothers, and the other is the Bluegrass Hall of Fame Inductee Biographies. Gary's performance today is a tribute to an Appalachian Mountain treasure. Carter Stanley was a gifted songwriter and an expressive singer who helped lay the foundations for what is today known as bluegrass music. He traveled as a performer for 20 years, um, passing away at the age of 41. Gone from the music scene for nearly 50 years, A Life of Sorrow gives today's audiences a chance to visit with a bluegrass legend as he tells the story of his life in old-time mountain music. Well, if you looked real close or studied my music, why, 
You just might see. But that was just something that called me to the stage that would never let go. Maybe it was that emptiness inside that well, it couldn't be filled but by the stage or the song or the clapping of hands. Come on, everybody, let's give it up one more time for Mr. Carter Stanley. Come on, everybody. Hey, hey. Well, thank you, folks. Thank you just a whole lot. Appreciate y'all coming out to be with us here this afternoon. Y'all be careful on your way home now. Goodbye now.
Well, we got up there before the sheriff did. And, and now they both were just laid up on the ground. And... Well, I just remember how quiet and still it was. No birds are singing, no breeze are blowing. No nothing. Well, some time went by. Somehow or another, the county got a hold to the old place. For back taxes, I guess. They put it up for auction. And I'm proud to tell you that our mommy and daddy bought it. <laughs> it's that a grizzly scene to get over. But you better know that it was, but but that little spot up on the mountain, why, why that was and still is heaven on earth. Well, from the highest point up there, where well, you can see ridge top after ridge top after ridge top. Well, you can see pretty near into three states from up there. But the best part of all, that's where we live with our mama and dad. And you know a lot of our music comes from right out of that hill. Well, you go up there sometime and, and walk around and just kind of study on the words to some of the songs. Well, you can just about see it in your mind. In the deep rolling hills of old Virginia, there's a place I love so well where I spend
And I would remember things that he had told me. Well, him and Bob both. They tell us. Sun don't go astray. Get them a crowd gathered around, they play them a little music. And then to keep 
the folks entertained with it, they would launch into some of these old, uh, these old skits, these, uh, these old vaudeville routines, I think is what it was. And after Tom got to riding around with us from one show day to another, going around in the car, he, he would start going over some of these deals. Next thing you know, he had us doing them. It wasn't long after that that we were doing them on our program. Well, that was the one about the book salesman. <laughs> Over the River Charlie. Well, Tom was quite a character. And you know, by the time we come along, a lot of these old timers, well, like Tom, that they kind of felt like life had kind of passed them by. And I always felt bad about it. Well, you know, in a lot of ways, it's just like the old horse. If he's made you a good living or paved the way for you in some manner, why, well, when he gets too old to work, don't shoot him. Put him out the pasture and let him rest a while. Let him graze. Let him enjoy what time he's got left. And that's the way it was with fiddling powers. Now, I first met him back in 1946. There I was, fresh out of the Army, working over in Norton, Virginia, with Roy Sykes and the Blue Ridge Mountain Boys. And Fiddlin' Powers used to come visit with us to the radio station. Oh, we'd let him play a tune or two on the program, and when it was over, we'd sit around the studio and swap stories and one thing and another. And it seemed like out of the five or six of us in the group that I was the youngest, and it seemed like I was the only one that had any time for the old man. I made a friendship there that lasted until he died. Well, after me and Ralph got our little deal going, uh, Fiddlin' Powers got to where he'd come visit with us. Started out staying two or three days and got to where he'd stay two or three weeks. Went where we went, did what we did. I think a man might be rewarded for, well, what would you call something like that? A good deed or something? remember the last show he ever did with us. We, uh, we, we done a little drive-in theater deal down in Blade Springs, Virginia, the, the Summit Drive-In Theater. And a lot of these drive-in deals we used to do, they, they wouldn't hardly ever have a stage set, of course, to put a program on with. Or oh, they might have a flatbed trailer or something set up in front of the movie screen. Or, or lots of times they, they'd have us to put a program on up on top of the concession stand where they, they sold peanuts and popcorn and soda pop. And, well, if it was a real nice place, they'd even have a set of steps built for us to get up to the top. Most times they just had a ladder thrown up against the side of the building. And I believe that's the way it was at the summit. Well, anyways, there it was up on top of the concession stand and putting on a program, floodlights flaring up at us and bugs flying around trying to get in their mouths and one thing and another. And, well, it come time for Fiddling Powers to do his little part of the program. All he helped the old man up the stage and got him situated at the microphone and, uh, well, Fiddling Powers wanted to tell the folks what it is you're going to do for him here this evening. Well, that, that's right. Go right ahead. Now, he played his usual tune, played it as good or better than I think I ever heard him play. When he was done, he made his way off the stage and back down to the car. We closed the program out not long after that. By the time we got down to the car, why, he was in awful pain in his chest. I had a good idea what it was, but but we told him the difference, you know. We tried to cheer him up. We took him to the local hospital and stayed with him until, uh, hey, 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 stop. The old man, Midland Powers. How is he? I see. Well, if you could make him as comfortable as you can, I appreciate said if we know any of his immediate family we'd better have them to get over there as quick as they can 
Now he passed away about 10 or 11 o'clock the next morning. We sang at his funeral. And you know, we've had a lot of requests over the years uh, to sing at funerals, but well, that's the only time we ever stood right at the graveside and, and took the instruments out of the cases and picked and sang. That was the way he wanted. You know, over the years, we, uh, we have a lot of people that come up to us and ask us about our music. Where does it come from? I don't rather know what to tell. And a lot of the same people that ask us about our music, well, they'll, they'll tell us that, that our music has the sound of the ages, the lonesomeness of the mountains. Me? I always just thought of it as a gift. Oh, I don't know. It's a lot of things, I guess. Well, you know, some of the first music we ever heard was back when we were little boys. Going to the McClure Primitive Baptist Church. Well, that's right. Come on in here. I, I want you folks to see this. I want you folks to hear this. Now, I, I don't know how much a lot of you folks know about the little Baptist churches we had back then like the ones we went to, but, well, a lot of them, they don't allow any musical instruments in the church. No guitars, pianos, organs. Just the human voice. Why that is, I don't know. Some sort of tradition, I guess. But they'll have a singer or song leader to, to get up and they lead the whole flock of people through a song, through a hymn, one line at a time. Line by line till they get the whole thing done. Well, in fact, that's what we call that kind of singing, lining out. Well, somebody might start off with something like, uh, uh, Of course, over the years, we take some of the old songs from the Baptist hymnal and 
Oh, we kind of bluegrass them up a little bit. Speed them up and put some music and harmony behind them. And, well, songs like a little messy. Come all you tender hearted. Folks seem to like that. And you know, growing up in the church like that, uh, well, I like to think I turned out what folks today might call spiritual. Oh, I'd read and study on all this stuff, and well, I'd write songs about it. I surely would. But as much as I would read and study on all this stuff and write songs about it, I have an independent streak about me. Ha <laughs> I like to kick back and rebel every now and again. Oh, I remember one time we was coming back from a show day once. Oh, it was dark. Late at night. There was a storm coming up. Lots of thunder and lightning and the old boy that was driving the car for us that night it had him shook up pretty bad. It didn't bother me any. I just rolled down the car window, stuck my fist up in the air and hollered, You think you can get me? Come on! Smooth the same. 
energy comes out of the fire. Tim and Bill Monroe, <laughs> oh, they had a mighty powerful duet. And Earl Scruggs, he was a set of the woods on fire with that fancy banter picking of his. Well, before Scruggs come along, nobody hardly ever heard of any kind of picking like that. And about the time that all this was a going on, that's when the Stanley brothers started making a name for themselves. Well, down in Bristol, Virginia, on radio station WCYB, six days a week, folks all over southwest Virginia, western North Carolina, east Tennessee, they got to hearing the music of the Stanley brothers. And we own that part of the country as far as old time hillbilly. That's right about the time the trouble started. Well, Flat and Scruggs, they got tired of beating the roads with Bill and Earl all the time, sleeping every night in the back seat of a car, working six and seven nights a week, or hardly ever having a chance to take their shoes and socks off but about once a week. So they turned their notice into Bill and Earl. But they hadn't been gone from it but about a week till they got an idea to make them a group of their own. Lester Flat, Earl Scruggs, and the Foggy Mountain Boys. One of the first places they decided to settle? Bristol, Virginia. Well, that wouldn't have been so bad, but well, me and Ralph was out on the streets of Bristol one day. We run, we, uh, we run into Lester Flat. All we exchanged had any news with him in one thing or another. Well, we hadn't been talking with him for too long until he took us to task about some of the songs we liked to sing. Once we heard of the Grand Ole Opry by Bill Monroe. Well, Lester told us since he was working with Bill Monroe and a lot of them songs was made popular. If anybody had a right to sing, it was him and not us. Then he just flat out told us that don't sing them songs. Well, one thing led to another, and the next thing you know, he's bad out the round. He can talk about me all he wants. But when he goes to running down my little brother, I just had to pop it. Things never was no better after that. All oh, except for flat and scrubs, that is. Oh, I told you that all that other stuff about them, the opera, the TV show, the sponsor. Well, the next thing you know, Time Magazine comes along, does a big article about the boys, makes it sound like flat and scrubs come up with this music all by themselves. Bill Monroe, much less the Stanley Brothers. But the thing that got my goat, they put the darn salary right there in the article. Said that after expenses, each one of the boys, each one of them cleared a hundred thousand dollars apiece. You know, he's lucky if our whole group cleared a hundred thousand before expenses. And not that I wanted to see the boys do bad, but, but there should have been enough of the pie to go around for everybody. Oh, I would think about that stuff all the time. We, uh, we, we had a good friend by the name of Bill Clifton. He, he's awful good to us. Uh, he helps us out when he can. Uh, let's be bounce ideas off of him at the daytime, nighttime. Well, Time of day don't seem to matter much when things are away on your mind. Hey, Bill, Carter, listen, I, I, I've got it, I've got it. I, I know how we can be popular like flat and scrubs. <laughs> That's right, we're going to learn to have to pick the band just like Earl Scrubs. I said, why would we want to do that? That Ralph's banter picking is one of the things that makes us special. Makes us unique. Hey, Bill? Carter? Listen, I, I, I've got it. I, I've got it. I, I know how we can be popular like flat and scrubs. That, that's right. I, I, I got a line on the used bus. I, just, just like the one flat and scrubs travels around there. Go, gonna fix it up, gonna, gonna get our name painted on the side of it, the Stanley Brothers and the Clinch Mountain Boys, and <laughs> oh, it's a thing. You, you ought to see. 
say, uh, Bill, we, uh, we, we need a couple thousand to put down on to seal the deal. Uh, can you help us out? I believe at the time that uh, Bill was just about as broke as we was. He never did get us a bus. For the most time, it was just three of us going out to make show dates anyway, me and Ralph and our, our guitar picker, George Shuffler. And you know, back when we was all starting out picking and singing this kind of music, right? Well, there wasn't that many people that was interested in it. And, and we was all scrapping after every audience member we could get. Made for some hard feelings between some of the groups. Well, as you can tell, we was no exception. But after about 15 or 20 years of it, I was getting kind of tired of it. I wanted to make my peace with flat scrubs. Oh, we run into Lester at a show date somewhere, and I, I went up to Lester and, and wanted to tell him how this stuff had, had been a, a bother of my conscience and weighing on my mind. Well, Lester just stood there looking at me. And Lester comes from way down in Tennessee where they don't believe in saying anything in a hurry. And he just let it out of this long, slow Tennessee drawl and said, said, Carter, said, you don't tell conscience. And then he just turned and walked away. I don't suppose I ever did make much sense out of all that stuff that went on between us. I did hear through the grapevine once that Flatten Scruggs said about us, said, uh, said we got to be on the picket, talking about us. But said we can't touch them on the sink. I don't know, I, I guess that's a compliment. And the folks that's all the time reading and studying on this music and, and writing articles in the magazine, they's all the time talking about the big three. Bill Monroe, Flat and Scrubs. And the Stanley Brothers. We're right in there with them, I guess. Well, somebody once told me that success is the best revenge. Now, I think you can measure success in different ways. Oh, the money would have been nice. But I think the music, our music, my music, it'll be around for a long, long time to come. That will be my success. Well, now it's time to say goodbye to Jed and all his kin. They would like to thank you folks for kindly dropping. Well, in case a lot of you folks hasn't figured it out by now, we was kindly raised up on hillbilly music. And to me, that's not a dirty word. Well, we listen to folks like the Carter family, Mayor's Mountaineers, the Monroe Brothers. And after Bill and Charlie Monroe kindly split up and went their own separate ways, well, well then there was Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. Used to see advertisements for him in the local paper when he would bring his program around our part of the country. They billed him as the greatest hillbilly entertainer of them all. And he was, too. And after we got to hearing the kind of music Bill was making with his group, we knew right then and there that that was the sound for us. Mandolins and fiddles, guitars and banjos. That was the kind of instruments Bill used to make his music. And that's the same kind of instruments we use to make our music. Of course, you know, it's not just the instruments, it's what you do with them. It's the, the rhythm and the drive and the power and the punch. That's what makes this kind of music. Now, Pee Wee Lambert was a fellow that understood all of this. Back when we first organized our group back in 1946, old Pee Wee was an original member of the group. And Pee Wee, 
given name of Darrell, but he kind of a short little feller. Somebody hung the name Kiwi on him. He, he could play the mandolin and pitch his voice just as high and clear, just like Bill Monroe. Well, you know, before Bill Monroe come along, nobody probably ever heard any kind of music like this before. Somebody once called it the folk music with overdrive, that, that all the music just kind of roaring at you like an express train. And I'm proud to tell you that after Bill Monroe, we was the same group to ever try to pick and sing this kind of music. And the fellow that helped us shape it that way, Pee Wee Lane. Now, now, back when we first started out, back in 1946, uh, we, we was kind of in the old-time hillbilly vein. First couple of records we ever had out, that's what they was, old-time hillbilly music. But we'd listen to Bill Monroe on Saturday nights when he'd be on the Grand Ole Opry from Nashville, Tennessee. And maybe if he had a new song, maybe one we'd never heard him do before. We, we'd all gather around the radio and we'd listen extra close and we'd try to copy down the words as best we could and... Well, as soon as Bill's program would go off the air, we'd get together and try to piece it together. And we'll come Monday at noon time when it was time for our farm and fun time program on WCYB in Bristol. Well, well Bill and Rose's new song from Saturday night would be a new song on our program. And we got real excited when we heard Bill do this one song about this, this famous horse race that took, took place out in Louisville, Kentucky. It must have been about 100 years ago. And they named the song after the two horses in the race, Molly and Ten Brooks. And you should have heard the way Bill done it on the opera. He had Scruggs doing that fancy banter picking, and Bill was courting the mandolin and singing sky high and clear. Well, we got so excited about it, we wanted to go in the studio and make us a record of it. And it was kind of a group thing. We didn't even have all the boys picking on it, but, but we wanted to take Pee Wee and put him out front and center. Had he played the mandolin and singing sky high and clear? Just like Bill Monroe. Now we didn't know if Bill would like it or not. As soon as the record come out and folks got to hear it. <laughs> Ooh <-wee. laughs> Well you know it used to be years ago if you heard a hillbilly record on the radio. Well you knew within the first two or three notes whether it was a a Roy A. Huff or an Ernest Tubb, they, they all had a style. Something unique that would make folks want to come out and see the program. And Bill Monroe was no different. Bill Monroe had a style. And when he heard us doing that song, the way that he done it, oh, 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 he wasn't pleased a bit. Oh, it got so whenever anybody would mention the Stanley Brothers around Bill Monroe, he saw red. But it didn't last long, and we, we packed things up with him. And, well, in fact, I went to work for him. I surely did. Things was kind of slow for our group at the time. The Korean War was heating up, and Uncle Sam kept calling on members of our group to, to go overseas and shoot bullets at people. So we took some time off, and I went to work for Bill, stayed with him three or four months, traveled all over the country, helped him make some records, played on the stage of the Grand Old Opry with him. Made me real proud when Bill Monroe had mentioned my name on the stage of the Grand Old Opry. Now, we'd like to call up one of the Blue Grace boys to help me do a little number here. One of the finest fellas to ever stand beside me on the stage and hold a guitar, and a fellow that has one of the best Naturally, voices that I've ever heard in my life. Of course, I'm talking about Mr. Carter Stanley. Carter, you get up here now and have me do this little number. One that we just have recorded called the Sugar Coated Love. Bill Monroe called my name on the stage the Grand Old Opry. You couldn't ask for a better friend than Bill Monroe. I couldn't ask for a better friend than Pee Wee Lane. Well, Pee Wee stayed with us four or five years. Helped us get going in that bluegrass direction. And after we'd had two or three records to come out, we, we wanted to come up with a sound of our own. Well, you know, something that was still like Bill's music, but well, something we could put our own spin on. We 
We've done it with our tree of those things. It used to be if a group of hillbillies wanted to do them a tree over, they would gang around the microphone, and one of the boys, usually the guitar picker, would, well, he would sing the lead, the melody, just put it out right smack dab in the middle there. Another one of the boys would add a harmony up above it, the tenor, and well, the last piece of the puzzle was another harmony underneath of all of it, the baritone. Lead, tenor, baritone, that was your standard trio. Well, we wanted to shake it up a little bit. Oh, we still put the lead and the tenor out there, but instead of leaving the baritone buried way underneath there, we, we yanked it out and stuck it way up on top, made a whole new part out of it, called it a, a, a high baritone. And because it was pitched so high and clear, the perfect person to sing it, Pee Wee Land. And you should have heard some of the records we done that way. The Lonesome River, the fields had turned brown. White dove. That was the same. But we didn't get rich off of it, and neither did Pee Wee. After he'd had two or three youngins to come along, well, we needed to make him an honest living. But I love about any time we'd be over in his part of the country where he and his family settled down, we'd, we'd stop in for a visit, catch up on old times and swap stories. And... And Pee Wee passed away not long ago. Forty years old. Heart attack. Because you know, early on, he, he, he was more than just a singing partner. <laughs> He's my drinking buddy. <laughs> well, his wife Hazel used to get after her. She, she'd say, how did you want to stand to hold your beer like that? I told her, Hazel, we don't hold it. We drink it. Music. My music. 
You know, we took it to 42 different states, seven foreign countries, wrote over 150 songs, made over 300 recordings, and had one of them in the top 20. But it's been a hell of a ride for a country boy from the hills. From the Clinch Mountains of Virginia and around the world. And back home again. Will you miss me? Will Today's presentation was, is called uh, A Life of Sorrow, The Life and Times of Carter Stanley, and it's a one-man show that I've put together which, uh, as the title implies, pays homage to Carter Stanley. Uh, Carter was a gifted singer, songwriter, musician who helped lay the foundations of what we know today as bluegrass music. Uh, he wrote the songs, he played the music, and he self-destructed. Uh, he uh, pounded the pavements for about 20 years, uh, after which time he passed away at the, the young age of 41 back in 1946. And uh, his songs are revered so much by today's uh, bluegrass pickers and singers, and uh, people know the songs, but he's been gone from the scene for so long that people don't realize that he was the, the driving force, the creator of all of these things. So uh, A Life of Sorrow is my little crusade to uh, let folks uh, know just where the music really came from. All right, and how long have you been doing this presentation? Uh, I started doing it in September 2014. Uh, so almost four years now. Uh, I've been to uh, 15 different states with it, as far north as Vermont, as far south as Florida, as far west as Arizona. And uh, just this past weekend, took it to Canada for the first time. I've given uh, about 80 performances altogether. If people want to learn more about you, is there a place to find you uh, online? Yeah, uh, alifeofsorrow.com.